I mean, the technology is great. You know, it's lots of fun, very helpful, makes a lot of things easy. Um, but like anything in the world, there is um, there is too much of a good thing, you know. Um, and I think one of the things we don't talk about is what is the balance of technology in our lives. And I would argue that for many of us, it's out of balance. Um, we know that the chemical dopamine is released whenever we get a bing, buzz, flash, or beep from our phone or email, right? So. Um, Dopamine is the exact same chemical that's released in alcohol, nicotine, and gambling, right? In other words, it can be addictive if left unbalanced. A little alcohol is great. Too much alcohol, not so great. Gambling is fun. Too much gambling, really bad, right? Technology is wonderful. Too much technology can be very destructive and destroy our relationships, like all addictions destroy our relationships, right? Um, and so what the, one of the things we're not considering is what is the right balance. If you wake up in the morning and you check your phone before you say good morning to your spouse, that's a problem, right? If you have phantom beeps, that's a problem. That comes from something, right? Um, if you find yourself incapable of getting through a day without needing to check, that's a problem, right? Now where it gets really dangerous is with kids, millennials. Some of them aren't kids anymore. Right. Um, so almost all alcoholics on the planet discovered alcohol when they were children. When we're very, very young, the only thing we need is the approval of our parents. Right? When we go through adolescence, we now need approval from our peers. Frustrating for our parents, very important for us because it allows us to acculturate outside of our immediate families into the larger group. Right? Very stressful time. And we're supposed to learn in this time of anxiety to rely on our friends, to reach out to our friends for help. That's what we're supposed to learn. Some people, quite by accident, discover alcohol. And then they learn the numbing effects of dopamine actually help them get through the stress of adolescence. This connection, unfortunately, becomes hardwired. And so for the rest of their lives, when they face any kind of financial, career, or social stress, they don't turn to a person, they turn to the bottle, right? Now, we have age restrictions on alcohol, cigarettes, and gambling. Because we know that an immature mind is not yet strong enough or mature enough to deal with the powers of these addicting chemicals, these addictive chemicals, right? So we put an age limit. We have no such age limit or age restriction on social media or cell phones, right? So ostensibly what we've done is we've thrown open the liquor cabinet and we've said to our adolescents, hey, I know this whole adolescent thing is really stressful, so here's the vodka, take as much as you need. That's basically what we've done. And so what we have is an entire generation that's growing up addicted. And like all addicts, they haven't learned the skill set of when they suffer stress to turn to a person. What they do is they turn to the device. And what that only does is increase senses of isolation and loneliness, and can actually destroy relationships. We've all had the experience where you're with somebody, walking down the street, in a meeting, out for dinner, whatever, and they pull out their phone, and you feel like an idiot, right? Or when you're talking to them and they're going, uh-huh, 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 and you're sort of like, what am I, what's the point of this? Now take an entire generation that has no memory of a time before the device. We at least can reference times before cell phones and internet and social media. We at least have a point of reference. They don't. So this is their normal, that that's how they feel. So you have an entire generation growing up with addiction and an increased sense of loneliness and isolation. We're already seeing the results. We're seeing increased rates of suicide amongst this generation. We're seeing increased rates of accidental deaths due to overdoses amongst this generation. We're seeing increased numbers of mass homicides largely performed by this generation. School shootings, yeah. over 70% perpetrated by kids born after the year 1984. We, um, schools, universities, are now dealing with numbers they've never dealt with before of kids requesting leaves of absence due to depression. We're already seeing it, right? We're seeing the effects of loneliness and isolation. We're seeing it, and yet we're not reacting to it. We're not doing anything about it, right? And parents are a lot to blame for this. Because parents, there are some schools who want to restrict phones in the schools, and it's the parents who demand that they keep their phones in case of emergencies. 
Seriously? Seriously? When was the last time the cell phone was used for an emergency? So what time are you coming home? What time should we pick you up? And if there is an emergency, you call the office and they know what classroom the kid's in and in five minutes, they'll bring the kid to talk to you on the phone. Like, the old way worked just fine. Remember we talked before about innovation. It has to solve a real human problem. What human problem exactly did we solve by compressing the five minute time frame? We added to the problem, we didn't solve yeah. it. So that's one huge problem. So combine that with the facts. So you have a, a, an addicted generation that doesn't have the, the skill set to ask for help. Combine with the fact that they're so good at Facebook and Instagram, they're good at putting filters on everything. So they're good at showing you how smart and strong they are. These kids who commit suicide, you go look at their Instagrams, you would have no clue that they were depressed because they're happy and they're star athletes, right? You'd have no clue because they're really good. So when we say silly things like, my door is always open, you're assuming they have the courage to come in. Combined with the fact that they're subject largely, not all, but too many, to a failed parenting strategy. Because their parents told them they were special, they could have anything they wanted, they can be anything they want, they got medals for coming in last, which by the way we know doesn't work, it devalues the medal for the one who comes in first, and the one who came in last, it makes them feel stupid because they know they didn't deserve it, right? The kids got into honors classes not because they deserved it, but because the parents complained, and some of them got good grades, not because they earned them, but because the teachers didn't want to deal with the parents. And then the kids graduate college, and they get a job, and in an instant, they find out they're not special, they don't get anything for coming in last, their parents can't get them a promotion, and you can't have whatever you want just because you want it. And in an instant, their entire self-image is shattered. And so you have an entire generation growing up with lower self-confidence than previous generations. So you have lower self-confidence than previous generations combined with an inability to ask for help with things that are, you're struggling with and you turn to social media or a device, you keep checking, you keep checking, you count your likes, you count your likes, you count your followers, you count your followers. And if somebody unfriends you, oh my God, it's trauma, right? The way they break up with each other is they just ghost each other, just cut each other out and stop returning to texts, returning texts and returning phone calls because they don't have the skill set to say, hey, it's not working out. It's not me, it's you, right? There's no closure on things, right? Combined with the fact there's an institutionalized impatience. So they've grown up in a world of instant gratification. You wanna buy something, you go on Amazon, it shows up the next day. You wanna get in touch with someone, you don't leave a message on their machine and wait four hours for them to get the message, you just text them and they get back to you immediately. You wanna watch a movie, you just log on and watch it. You don't have to check movie times, right? Everything happens instant. You wanna get a date, swipe right. You don't even have to muster up the courage to go up like, hey, you know? You don't have to. There you go, got a date, right? And so the problem is, they're accused of being entitled. I don't think they're entitled at all. Not at all. I think they're impatient. I keep meeting these fantastic, smart, driven, ambitious, idealistic, fantastic kids who graduated school, they got a job, they want to make an impact in the world, and I go up to them and say, how is it going? And they say, I think I'm going to quit. I'm like, why? They're like, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, you've been here eight months. And it's as if, it's as if they see the summit of a mountain. So it's as if they're standing at the foot of a mountain, they can see the summit, they can see the thing they want, they want to make an impact. What they don't see is the mountain. This large, immovable object. You can go up fast, you can go up slow, I don't care. But there's still a mountain. What they don't understand is that life, that relationships, and career fulfillment are a journey. There's no app for that. I got nothing. You gotta go through the slow, plodding, annoying, meandering process called career and life. But if they don't get it in eight months, they go look for it somewhere else. They don't get it, they go, go look for it somewhere else. It's impatience. And because they don't have the skill set to ask for help, and because they feel lonely, it compounds and compounds. So then yeah, we dump them in office environments that are built on theories from the 80s and 90s that prioritizes a number before a person, and no one really cares about their confidence and their personal growth. They're just numbers on a spreadsheet. And so they enter work cultures that don't help them. And the problem is they're entering the workforce at a deficit. I hear from kids, they tell me that they struggle to form deep meaningful relationships and the companies don't care. And so it's destructive to them as individuals, but ultimately it'll hurt the companies because more and more millennials are entering the workforce. I believe, to your point about solution, that now the responsibility 
on companies is even greater than it's ever been before to take care of its people. Because if the environments in which we're asking our youngest workers to work in isn't built to help them, I can't even imagine what the suicide and, and homicide and just the rates of depression, you know, an accidental death due to overdose are gonna look like in the future. It's gonna reach epidemic proportions. It's already, the, 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 the statistics are already alarming and yet nobody's sounding any alarm bells. Parents have to intervene. We have to stop giving our kids free access to social media and, and phones at young ages. They are not ready for it. Their minds cannot cope with the dopamine. Balance is fine. You can give a kid a phone, but they can't use it in their bedroom. They can't have it at the dinner table. They can't take it to school. They can only have it up to a certain hour and you take it away. They're children. You can take the phone away. We've got to intervene as parents. But as companies, we now have to deal with the influx of kids that are coming into our companies with addiction. Watch, I see it all the time. Walk through any office. You'll see the older employees have their phones on the sides of their computers as they're working. You'll see the youngest employees have their phones face up in front of their keyboards between their arms as they're working. And this is how they work. And the, the, the science is alarming. They did uh, experiments on mice where they, they did the multitasking. They put flashing lights to mimic going from the computer to the cell phone, the computer to the cell phone, to the TV. The mice that were exposed to the changing lights, it took them three times longer to solve a maze than the mice that weren't. And the damage was permanent. It didn't improve when they stopped the lights. Never. And leadership now is even more important. Yeah. And the leaders now are even more irresponsible. You are responsible for the lives of human beings, and some of these human beings are your children. So okay, you bad CEO who thinks all the stuff that I talk about is craziness. And you don't have time to make these changes. This is I hear. We don't have time. It's a war out there. I've actually heard executives tell me that. It's a war out there. I don't have time for this leadership stuff. I know guys who go to war, and I'll tell you, it's not a war, what you're going through. You know, you tinker with money. It's not a war. You do have time for this. And if it's really that way, then what were you doing when it wasn't a war? It's even more, it's what an indictment that in peaceful times, when times were good, that you weren't focusing on this stuff, right? But my point is, is a lot of these executives have children of this age working at other companies. And my question is, would you like those other companies? Would you like those other executives to care about the growth of your child, the confidence of your child, the career success of your child? Would you like those other companies to help your kids learn the skills of social interaction, the ability to ask for and receive help? Would you like their jobs to give that to them? Set the example. Do it for other people's children. Every single employee, 100% is someone, someone, someone's daughter. 100%. And if you want someone to take responsibility for the life of your children in their company, then why don't we start taking responsibility for the lives of the children in our company?